So, ladies and gentlemen, I think that you will probably agree that all the panels and working group sessions that we have heard so far have provided, provided a very comprehensive, very productive look at how digital transformation is occurring all across the formal and informal education chain. And certainly our discussions have underlined that when we talk about that entire education uh, experience, we are talking about a lifelong experience. Learning is no longer, if it ever was, a one-time affair. So education that truly paves the way for a digital future must be lifelong. That's been really uh, something that's been emphasized by many of the speakers we've heard here over the past two days. In this final forum on digital transformation of lifelong learning, that's our title, we want to try to tie together what we've heard over the past two days. What we're not going to do, although we have representation from all four of the panels, we are not going to stay in uh, what uh, Professor Hesse ta talked uh, about as boxes. We're going to try to really get entirely out of the boxes and focus on overarching goals and principles that can guide the transformation of lifelong learning. And I want to do that with reference to the key principles and propositions of the Berlin Consensus because they do, in fact, cut across many of these different phases boxes that we've talked about. So we have a fantastic panel here to go on this uh, exploration uh, with us. And uh, I'll just remind you who our panelists are. P for panel one, uh, at, the, at this side of the panel, we have Eckhard Winter, who is the managing director of the Deutsche Telekom Stiftung. Next to him, representing panel two on higher education. If you remember, that first panel was a digitally enhanced classroom uh, that Eckhard Winter chaired. So, Panel two, we have Elijah Bitanga Nadiemo, who's assistant professor at the University of Nairobi and former permanent secretary at Kenya's Ministry of ICT. For panel three on the digital transformation of companies, uh, represented here by Irina Bercek, who is head of the research department ICT uh, at uh, the Center for European Economic Research, whose acronym in German is ZEW. And finally, panel four on informal education. Uh, it's great to have Susanna Walsh back with us on the stage uh, from the Gates Foundation. So we definitely want your input, ladies and gentlemen, throughout the panel. I'm going to try to take questions as they come in. And, uh, uh, you know about the pigeonhole tool, I don't have to remind you, and we've also got these for you. I would like to start out with category one in the Berlin Consensus, which is basically the category of mindset and skills. And um, I'm going to just put questions out there and ask whoever wants to address them to give me a sign. And uh, short answers would allow for more dialogue, so they are very, very welcome indeed. Uh, First thing, and this came up uh, in Suzanne's panel just now, um, the consensus refers to a focus on agility and creativity as being at least as important as material resources, including technology. This is in the se section on mindset and skills. So there's a reference to agile working. What would you say that means in practice, in your experience? Where have you seen examples of agile working that you think could provide a basis to build on for future? Anybody want to pick up on that one, Eckhard Winter? Well, I think uh, schools have to change completely to adopt this agility. Uh, we saw this example of Agora in, in Holland yesterday. So you have to drop subjects. You have to, uh, to learn by, uh, by problems, by solving problems. And uh, I think, at least in some countries like Germany, the tradition is in the way of agility. And uh, uh, that brings me to mindset, uh, because we, we learned that uh, resistance, inertia, teacher beliefs, and mental models are so strong uh, that it's very hard to overcome uh, them. So also for schools, I think we need some kind of implementation science to be more agile uh, in the future. Anybody else want to speak to that? Mr. Nudema? It's on. Go ahead, it's on. One of the biggest problems is uh, policymakers. Uh, there are so many policies governing education at the moment, 
and some have to be revised to so that they can be in line with the the current status where things change so frequently and uh, it takes so long to take a bill through parliament in most parliaments in our case it takes almost a year um, and by then people have forgotten the whole purpose of trying to do it <laughs> then academia we also have a we contribute to this lack of agility by uh, focusing too much, saying we have to do research and create and get evidence. And st even, even though we know that some studies, like the studies that we've listened to here, we could, base, based on the findings, we could actually begin implementation or some uh, pilot. So you're telling us essentially that we also need agile structures, agile policy frameworks, and not simply uh, agile pupils and schools. Anybody else? Agile academicians. <laughs> Yeah, maybe if I think of companies as the environment, um, uh, my impression is that IT companies uh, are those that are most digitalized compared to, to companies in, in other sectors, and they often apply agile working, uh, working sets. Yeah, And so I think um, other companies or companies from other sectors could learn from that. Uh, but as we heard yesterday, also managers and CEOs are key to, uh, to allow for such uh, changing environments. So they are key in, in uh, giving good examples themselves, by themselves, yeah, uh, by, by uh, being agile and uh, keeping, be, uh, being on the, on the learning track themselves and also allowing uh, uh, an agile environment or creative environment to their employees. I think that agile learning means being able to apply knowledge in multiple contexts. And yesterday we heard Harold talk about um, the idea of coding for everyone is not a concept, it's a band-aid or a shortcut. And I think we have to be cautious about when we are talking about skills um, that can be applied in multiple contexts. That's what I think of it, mm -hmm. agile learning. I can apply skills in multiple contexts. I'm not just learning something just as a shortcut, just as something f to apply to one single problem. So agile learning, I think, is that ability to apply across multiple uh, settings. Let me pick up uh, on that particular aspect. When we talk about skills, have we heard a really compelling definition of what digital skills are? Well, I think on uh, the gentleman, <laughs> the students asked this question earlier. I, you know, we were challenged with this, and, and the answer uh, from my panel was, were, it's the same skills, was it 40,000 years ago? I don't remember yeah. the, the time frame, 40,000 years ago. And so I don't know that we've made a distinction, and I don't know whether it's important to make a distinction, because those key skills sort of are related to working in a digital environment as well as working um, in an analog environment. I don't, I don't know that I'm pressed to want to do that. Maybe it's uh, part of those skills are very traditional but uh, should be emphasized more, like, like arts, like creativity. Uh, but also uh, problem solvers, uh, solving is com computational thinking we heard yesterday. So. Uh, that's certainly a modern skill we need more, uh, which can be anchored in mathematics and informatics in, in, in the school curriculum. Uh, so it's a diversity of, of skills we need, social skills, soft skills, uh, um, more than ever. So maybe what we don't need is the label digital skills. Well, I think it's a question. I think that if you, at, we heard this, I think, as an intro yesterday, too. When you ask students, I think specifically sort of high school and, and maybe primary school students about digital learning, it's not even an idea for them. The concept of digital <laughs> learning, it's just, <laughs> right. what, I'm just learning, or I'm just using yeah. whatever the technology. So I think it is one of these things that if you weren't sort of born digitally, uh, well, can you say that? Anyway, you know what I mean. If you're not yeah. a digital native, I yeah. think that it, it's a question that you ask, and if you're a digital native, it's just that's how the world operates, and so why, why the distinction? Right. Yeah, my, maybe one, one further point is that uh, self-determination becomes more important as a skill for everyone, students, also um, uh, employees, and that um, still 
Um, we need more interdisciplinary knowledge, yeah? not only engineering, but also software skills, not only um, analyzing data, but also being inter able to interpret the results. And at the same time, we need to, um, students need to learn how to, that, that was said yesterday, dive deeply into a subject. Yeah? So whatever it is, or, or whatever comes up during the working life. Mr. Ndedema. I, I tend to think that y humans are very complex, uh, that uh, what we think that we provide digital skills, um, there is no defined way of doing it other than access. I say this because um, there are some applications now which are used by both uh, literate, literate and illiterate people in my country. Uh, simply because there was access. Uh, they have access to broadband, access to, uh, to the mobile, and they are able to, to use it to get money. Uh, those are digital skills, but nobody actually sat them down to teach them the skills. Um, so I, I look at that question from the point of access, and it's one of the, of the five areas that we are looking at. If you provide access, human beings would figure out how to use it, no matter what, if they have a purpose for that. Thank you. Um, in terms of general 40,000-year-old skills, one that would be very high on my list as a journalist, as an American, and as a mother would be critical thinking and the ability to weigh evidence, exactly for the reasons that Rushhold also talked about. What convincing approaches have you seen in your work toward inculcating that ability, be it formally or informally? Anybody? I think um, we ha in Germany we have a very good uh, arena of um, initiatives for uh, science and, and research learning outside schools. So. Uh, uh, inquiry-based learning uh, has to be inside schools, but uh, also outside schools and universities and companies. And that's why uh, it is so important that schools open up and peer out of the box and, uh, and link uh, into non-formal and informal settings um, where this inquiry-based learning is possible. and. Uh, uh, and works better than maybe in, in the school system itself. I am lucky that I, I mean, not, uh, I mean, I went to school in the U.S. and I teach in Africa. Um, the U.S., uh, one of the courses you must do is critical thinking um, and in some cases design thinking and stuff. Um, and some the systems that we adopted um, in most countries, they don't inculcate that in the systems. I'm not saying they're not creative people, but it, it, it sure helps to have such course um, in, in, at university level um, and, and to just to, to trigger that uh, creativity. And, and I think it can only be done at university level and we've been advocating that we need to have such courses in our curriculum, but we are strictly under the British system, and I'm still trying to find out where the British put it, whether it's, it's in primary or in, yeah. Irene Bercek, you undoubtedly are cognizant of the discussion here in Germany about whether there need to be mandatory courses in media use. And where would you come down on that? Um, and isn't that possibly an area that could equally well be addressed uh, with a good basic course in elementary principles of critical thinking? Yeah. Well, <laughs> mandatory courses uh, of media use. I think it, it might be, it's useful to learn how to deal with media and with content and that uh, students should learn, not only students, everybody should learn not to rely on one source, yeah. 
So, for example, only on Facebook. Yeah. Um, and as researchers, we are used to consult different sources to make up our minds about a specific topic. So this should be learned. Um, media courses only make sense if they are regularly adapted to new technologies, new uh, skills, and so on. So uh, as we heard yesterday, education is too slow, in fact, for yeah. digitalization and uh, to keep case with digitalization. So if we, if we are able to uh, create concepts of media courses that are that adapt to this um, to this technological progress and to this uh, content progress of content then it, it is very useful speaking of adaptation of courses i'd like to come back before we leave this first uh, area of the berlin consensus come back to uh, something that i think uh, ekahad vinto said at the outset regarding the slow pace of change in curricula and ask about the tension between curricula and customization because a number of you have talked about the new opportunities for customization and on the other hand do we then jettison curricula altogether the berlin consensus refers to continual updating of curricula what are the challenges uh, that are involved there and how do we overcome them anybody Suzanne? So I think in, in the United States, the most nimble um, higher education institutions in terms of responding to the demands of employers are the community colleges. And they have very strong, those who are best at this have really strong relationships with local employers. And so the local employer can say to them, we need more nurses with the following skills. And the community college is able to quickly respond and adjust curriculum with input from an advisory group uh, of employers. I think those sorts of serious partnerships where you can say, I have this immediate demand, and it, sometimes it means that the community college creates a certificate program to respond to a, a really uh, sort of fast-moving need. But having that constant employer relationship and partnership, I think, is, is very important. It's the only way to speed it up a little bit in the US, quite frankly, because the employer says, I have a need now. But also, it's a realistic uh, request from a customer, as it were, of those colleges to say, this is what we need, and here are the things that we're looking for. But the challenge for the employer is to be able to describe what they're looking for in a way that then is translatable into curriculum. It's not always translatable, but I think if that's possible, those are, those are kind of the best examples for me. I think Eckhard Winter, so and then I'll come to you. In Germany, we, we left this uh, term of curriculum to a certain extent because we, our orientation is to, uh, to, to competencies. And uh, when you work on problems, the curriculum is less important. In these extreme cases like Agora, curriculum doesn't make sense anymore. Um, and uh, because development of curricula is much too slow to adopt to the speed uh, uh, of development in the digital world. So uh, competencies, skills are important, and that's a shift which is also slow in our system. It's there, it's written, uh, but it's not adopted by all the lender. We have this federal system with 16 states within Germany, uh, different uh, speed in, uh, between them. Uh, but we are on, on that way to leave the notion of, of curriculum. Yeah, I think given the fact that um, people spend so much of their time in, in, in the labor market uh, when, when they've left ed formal education, and, and I think the responsibility of companies is nowadays uh, much higher than it was uh, two or three day decades ago. So a lot of learning takes place within the companies, and uh, so... Uh, I agree that maybe the connection or uh, giving feedback to, to schools and uh, uh, higher educational institutions to, uh, to adapt to the needs of, of, of the working world is, uh, might be quite, quite difficult. So uh, the, a lot has to take place within the firms. I, I think we need, um, I'll be interested to, to learn from the German system because um, there, there is a whole system of regulatory framework and also um, accreditation 
And, and that's where we are stuck in that mess, even, when, even though we know that we actually need to change and move forward. How we can disrupt um, the regulatory processes, I don't know. I, I don't. Thank you very much. Yeah, Suzanne? Well, well I just, uh, this idea that curriculum is no longer relevant and that competencies are you know, the new currency, I think is, is really, it's very provocative. I think it's exactly the right, uh, the right conversation, but I'm thinking about it in terms of Lauren's presentation yesterday, Lauren and Richard's presentation yesterday. Yeah. If faculty members think that they own content, what, sort of what does this do to the role of the faculty member when we say it's not about content, it's about competencies? Yes, great. That's exactly where I want to go, in fact, uh, into the next item. But uh, Eckhart Winter, did you want to add to that? or Go ahead. I mean, the aspect of uh, disciplines, of subjects in schools is very important. We learned about interdisciplinarity yesterday, and, and problems don't come in challenges. The big challenges don't come in disciplines. Right. They are interdisciplinary by nature. Tell that to all the ministries and uh, <laughs> commission departments and so on out there. Um, so I'd like to move into, in fact, the structural uh, area. The Berlin Consensus also has a whole section on structures, and it talks there, among other things, uh, about the need for strong, not only IT, so technology structures, but of course, training and support structures, including staff development teams. We heard that great working group, uh, number one, uh, look at what is working and not working at Carnegie Mellon. I'd like to take it a bit beyond that uh, and ask what evidence you have seen of what works in terms of support for um, helping staff, educational staff, make changes, be flexible, be agile. Um, we heard Richard talk, say it's about love in the end. It's not about uh, material incentives. So uh, love is a great thing to go by, but what else? <laughs> Um, from my experience, um, you, you really have to be a revolutionary to change this because um, we are still stuck with those uh, seminars, uh, consultants coming to tell us, and sometimes consultants have no idea, and even the person who is crafting the course you are going to go through is a procurement officer, um, it, 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 um, structures are a problem. I mean, do we need, if there is something that needs to be disrupted in, in the educational systems, is um, that let the, the academic staff decide. Um, but sometimes we are called for a training program and it's useless and, and nobody attends. Uh, so we actually need to begin to define what defines us in the days to come and, and develop it together other than what the institutions decide that we are going to take you through this program and stuff like that. So if in digital area, um, it is the lifelong learning that has helped where you do it by yourself. Um, you can never get it through this, the institutions. They, they have not woken up. It's not in their mental uh, space. May I just ask you a follow-up question on that? Because you said it in the panel yesterday as well. Essentially, uh, given your experience, as I understand it, with the shortcomings of policymakers and policy frameworks and perhaps also educators at times, you've essentially said a number of times, give people the resources and they will make something out of them. Um, yet we heard today from working group number two that that hasn't always been as effective as was hoped. You know, the idea, uh, let's take some small, easy to work with computers uh, to uh, African school kids and see what happens, that the results were perhaps not always as productive as had been hoped. What would you say to that? And if, if there could be supporting structures put into place to make them more effective, what should those look like given the various shortcomings you've talked about. Actually, I can say here that everything that I did that succeeded, I broke the law. <laughs> um, and, 
It's because uh, you get frustrated in the process. And I have seen donor money come uh, to teach young people about entrepreneurship, and they have grand ideas, a consultant and everything, spend about $5 million. And uh, the same, same kids who went through that program, which did not succeed, I say, let's sit down here on YouTube and uh, make banana bread, because there are too many bananas in where we are. Yeah. And uh, we make the bread, and they sell it. Uh, very simple, v very simple. But uh, the donor agencies are stuck that you need a structure that has somebody to look at this and this. And, and by the time you finish, you have spent all the resources yeah. um, doing that. So that's why I'm saying that we need to break that system, the structure thinking, and make it, I don't know how that can be done, but um, that's how uh, things work. We have helped young people set up enterprises out of YouTube without cost. But if you look at the amount of money that have been spent on helping young people create enterprises, it runs into billions. Um, so you ask yourself, when will they listen and look at this? That, that is the biggest problem that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, Ekafad Winter, you wanted to come? Yeah, when it comes to staff development, I think it's, uh, the answer is, uh, on the one hand, very easy, and on the other hand, very complicated. What we need is a culture of sharing, which is facilitated by uh, digital tools. Uh, and that means peer coaching, peer learning, reverse coaching. We heard that from, from industry yesterday, that there is reverse mentoring, that CEOs are mentored by their employees, things like that. But that comes, then we come back to the mindset of teachers, a changing role, which is also mentioned in, in the paper, non-traditional role of, of the teacher, and more as a guide and not as, as an instructor. And that makes things very difficult uh, uh, to do, but, but the, uh, the, uh, the concept is very easy. That's the culture of sharing in the institutions and, uh, and beyond. And I, you know, to build on uh, Richard's love and appreciation uh, for faculty, I think that including faculty from the beginning in any kind of change process is critical. So not doing things to the faculty or for them, but with them. I think is absolutely essential. So in the work that we do uh, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, when we work with institutions that have been incredibly effective with their faculty, it's because the faculty have had a voice from the beginning. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit of a cantankerous voice, but, they, but their voice is heard and they're engaged from the beginning. Uh, and not necessarily having the external consultants come in, but actually thinking about faculty from other institutions as coaches I think is another really important component of that. Can I also just ask you a follow-up question on what we heard from Mr. Dedemo regarding what you might call donor bias or structural biases arising from donor focus? So the question would also be agile donors. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with that? I know it's come up with the Gates Foundation in the, in the medical arena, and I don't want to take us too far in that direction, but looking at this in the educational arena. Oh, yeah. I mean, so we get this in the educational. We get this, in, especially in our, our work with K-12, um, which has really had a heavy policy emphasis for something called the Common Core, which sounds fantastic because it really is about basic skills and how um, what, how do you think about the competencies for K-12 students? But the way that it came across, I think, and the way that we approached our work there, and this is true in, in a number of areas for us, is that it comes across as we are dictating what we think the world should be from Seattle or from one of our offices somewhere else. And we've had to learn over time, and we're trying to get better. We actually do a grantee perception survey. So we know, we get the feedback very directly, uh, we publish it. Um, and so part of what we've been working on is really trying to be, in fact, better listeners, better collaborators. And it's, we, we've never gone into um, 
sharing what we've learned in a way that we mean to come across as so dictatorial, but we have a position, I mean, the money gives us a position of power. And so we are really trying to do much more collaborative, on the ground learning from the beginning. Uh, however, that being said, in higher education, this is a big issue in the United States right now, especially with uh, very large donors. It's very hard to say if somebody wants to give you many, many millions of dollars for a very specific thing, like a new sports field. It's very hard to say, no, I would like that for the philosophy department. It just doesn't quite work. Um, and so there, there are, I think, we're going to see quite a bit of activity as um, colleges and universities, starting with the faculty, are starting to question the role of donors and um, how do you push back with donors and how do you get that sort of agility? So I've got a lot of questions coming in now. I've got one up here that also goes to a structural uh, aspect that is mentioned uh, in the Berlin Consensus, which we've touched on in the cross-cultural setting and a little bit in the other settings, but it's uh, it's among other things, also an access and inclusion issue. So the question is this, I'm going to, when I take these audience questions, I'm gonna say that not everybody needs to answer every question or we won't unfortunately get to them all, but this question is education that liberates, also potentially alienates from the status quo, perhaps you could say also from your origins sometimes, as we help individuals to self-determine their path, should we understand and help them with cultural implications? Anyone have a thought on that? Maybe Mr. Nadimo? Yes, and I think you saw it play here yesterday. Um, when we were talking about higher education, we were saying MOOCs don't work. Uh, today, when we were discussing about uh, informal education, MOOCs were being talked about. Um, and also the presentation from Ami and uh, Judith, um, although very expensive to implement, it, it says a lot. And I think uh, we need to find ways of uh, how can we scale uh, a study like that one. I think those are the areas we need to look at. Um, yes, education liberates and sometimes alienates um, others from the systems. Um, not just along uh, the, the cultural lines, uh, but because, um, as I said yesterday, it's because the studies that were done here were generalized across the world. I, I think we need more contextual studies also to, to be taken into account. Thank you very much. Um, I've got two questions here that refer to essentially workplace issues. So, uh, Irene Bercek, maybe you want to take a, a shot at them. And also, um, Eckhart Winter, here's the first one. How does workplace culture need to change to enable faster individual and organizational learning? And I'm going to, well, there's a second one. Can you both re re remember that for a moment while we look at this second one as well, and maybe then you can address both of these points. Second one is this, the concept of empirical evidence-based models that replace expert opinion is a powerful one in teaching. Should we also seek it in models for professional development? So, workplace culture changes to foster faster individual and organizational learning, and then how do we incorporate this focus on empirie and evidence uh, also within professional settings. So, Irena? Yeah, I, I tried to start. <laughs> so how should workplace culture change? I mean, in fact, we already discussed this a little bit with the first question on the mindset, right? If we uh, change the mindset and uh, try to get more agile, uh, this is also related to, uh, to workplace culture. I mean, we know from uh, economic research that um, investment in, in technology should be complemented by investment in organizational capital and human capital. And this is somehow uh, related, yeah? So there is empirical evidence for that. And so how can we do that uh, as we, if, if managers are uh, flexible, if they allow flexibility to their employees and uh, um, self-determination, responsibility, this can help to also make the workplace culture change. Now, with respect to the empirical evidence-based models, I mean, evidence-based models are 
crucial yeah, to understand how learning works. And uh, I think this is also one point that we need more research and more assessment of learning concepts. I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, an education uh, researcher, so maybe others here in the room can, can contribute to this question much more. But I think if we develop new learning concepts, uh, we, we also have to assess their uh, outcome. Yeah? And, uh, so, and this is something that we, we, we need uh, also for for professionals, for employees, if they, if they use new tools. Is it, are these tools really worth it? Do they help? Is the outcome if, with respect to productivity, efficiency, innovativeness, and so on, uh, really helpful? That certainly holds true for other areas, and we haven't talked much about professional development of teachers, and there is much evidence now, and uh, these evidence-based models should enter uh, continuous professional development of teachers, but we, we don't have the time to sit in the ivory tower. So uh, new ways of like design-based research was mentioned yesterday, uh, where scientists learn together with the, the pr practitioners. And uh, I think that's very important to be more agile in, the, in this field as well. Thank you very much. I'm going to put a question up here that um, I'm going to answer, and uh, I'm going to essentially take this just as a suggestion. Uh, yes. Yes, I think so. I think the more we can create new conference formats that get uh, real interaction going between all of us, uh, the better. And um, anybody disagree? Anybody out there disagree? OK. <laughs> let's, let's move on to. Um, Another question that essentially also addresses structures, literally, physically, who's going to rebuild all the schools and university buildings for more agile teaching paradigms? Or let's just say for different approaches than the ones we have now, because universities and schools often have millions and billions of infrastructure backlogs. Is there anyone on the panel who wants to try to address that? Uh, because indeed, to what degree, I guess the real question is, to what degree does physical infrastructure act as an obstacle? Well, I think um, what we saw was it called Agora, Agora, Agora? Uh, yesterday. I mean, that physical setting, I loved um, that the gentleman also said that it was, it creates a sense of wonderment or wonder when you enter the room. And I think that that's, the physical setting really does matter. I mean, we've all been very excited about this physical setting. It's bright. If we had been in a place with no windows, I think we all would have passed out by now. We may not have lasted this long. So, you know, the, the importance of, of a physical setting, I think, matters. What we've seen in terms of who's, who's doing this well right now, we've seen quite a few colleges and universities completely redoing their libraries so that in the United States, so that the library is no longer a quiet place for books. It is a place to interact in open spaces. They've learned a lot from places like, you know, the Apple Store and other co-working spaces so that it's public, it's lively, it's a cafe. And so I don't know that the there are costs associated with that, but that's different than building a brand new building. I think there are ways of, of using old spaces in new ways um, and moving some of those uh, pieces of furniture, quite frank, frankly, around to be able to create a new environment that's more engaging? I think it's, um, it's very important to include architecture in, in the whole um, view of the digital world, because digital education, I don't like this term, it's not just iPads and computers, it's, uh, it's built environment for learning. And we are missing a chance in Germany at the moment because in cities growing like Berlin, uh, there is a, a high demand of new uh, school buildings and there is even the money for that, but they are built on old plans, on traditional plans that are in the bu bureaucracy uh, safe, and that's it. So we will see the same lecture theaters as we, uh, as we did 30, of, uh, 30 years ago. And uh, I think it's very, very important to uh, put emphasis on this aspect of, of the built environment for teaching and learning. Briefly. I just wanted to add that um, whatever there is a will, there is a way. Um, two, three years ago, 
our president said he wanted to give a uh, laptop to, to grade one kids. And everybody said, oh, there is no electricity in the rural areas. Two years down the road, every school has electricity in the very remote parts. Uh, so often what, what used to happen is that uh, this would be too expensive. Who would give us money from, which donor would give us money? Then we, we spend time thinking about the resources. So if you really want to do it, it can actually be done even by the parents bringing the resources together to, to build those schools. You are definitely the voice of resourcefulness on our panel. Um, I've got a couple of different inputs that I'd like to just read off as good impulses, good, good uh, inputs, and then move on to just a couple more questions because we're rapidly running out of time here. So here's one, students teaching students while supported by a teaching guide, an approach where we're constantly either learning or teaching, or both, of course. Is that a good approach to lifelong learning? I doubt anybody is on this panel who would say no. Um, so here's another one. Um, is not education a value in itself, which should not be too quickly given up for usefulness and agility? Um, again, people nodding. I think we can just let that stand. Um, and um, there's a couple of MOOC, MOOC questions. We did a lot on MOOCs. I think I'm not going to take those questions right now. Um, let me come to another aspect of the structures discussion in the Berlin Consensus, and it relates to collaborative culture and something that all of us know from working with young people, um, the proclivity for borrowing, in other words, what we used to call plagiarizing, and intellectual property uh, structures. To what degree, when we talk about legal frameworks, policy frameworks that need to change, is this a crucial area uh, that is holding us back in relevant ways? I think we have an ongoing discussion uh, on that in Germany at the moment uh, because we have this digital uh, strategies of the lender and, and the, uh, uh, the federal government. I'm unfortunately not an expert in that field, but open educational resources and, and intellectual property rights, it's very important because teachers don't know how, how to handle that. They, um, it's, 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 they need a clear di direction in, in, in that field, but we are in the process of developing that. I don't know the situation in other countries. Anyone else? I had assumed that uh, we learn from German with respect to creative commons. Um, I don't know whether I'm wrong that uh, you practice more creative commons than IP in, in German. And, and I think it, it's the best way because it's, it's, it's much more a relaxed way of protecting your, your intellectual property. I think... Um, and, and we've been saying Germany is doing it and we, we should be doing it here. Um, I, that's what I think. I don't know anybody can, can say anything about it. And it's a big challenge for the publishers, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And I hate to bring up MOOCs, but, <laughs> I, <laughs> but I will. Uh, but I think this is a very interesting question because what is using a MOOC but a form of plagiarizing? I mean, I'm going to take this thing created by somebody else and I'm going to use it in my classroom as if it were mine. And we, we actually reward that behavior. We think that this is a good idea when somebody is taking and reusing someone else's work. And so I think that especially current sort of high school age students, it's very confusing that you know that this may be happening, how do you, but, but, I'm be, but I can't use somebody else's thing. Um, so how do, you, how do you actually help students to make, back to your media question, I mean, making good decisions and understanding um, when and how to use information is, a, is really a key skill. Thank you very much. Let me go on to another audience question, which takes us into the next category in the Berlin Consensus, which is drivers. Uh, what are going to be the drivers of change going forward, and what kind of inspiration or challenges do they pose? So here's one on the question of uh, the thoughts on startups and their role in driving changes in education. And I might add to that a question which essentially is raised in the Berlin Consensus. Uh, concerning who are likely to be the next big new actors. 
Please, Mr. Nedema, and then, yeah. Um, actually, yesterday I pointed to a Kenyan startup, Enesa. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think these are the ones, the names, you probably won't hear Microsoft, or, uh, but you would hear such big names, <laughs> small names becoming big. Um, my thinking is that uh, we are just almost about to see a disruption in education, especially with startups around education, because um, they are perfecting, improving, and we are seeing adop adoption rates going high. Um, and it's just a matter of time, we would probably see some big startup in education um, across the world. Just like Khan Academy has succeeded. Irina Berchet, you wanted to add? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you think of startups not only as a provider of education, but as a environment yeah, for learning also, they are often less um, traditional, less conservative. And uh, they live uh, this sharing and uh, learning from each other. Still, there is evidence showing that uh, mixed teams are important for a successful startup. Yeah, so you having only creative people um, from one discipline is not necessarily uh, the ground for for a successful company that survives for three or five years. But you have to have a mixture of skills within the founding team in order to be successful. And I think this is also important. I mean, we said that uh, mixed teams are important for learning. They are also important for having success uh, in the economy. I think uh, the importance of ed tech startups is, is growing. And, and there will be a startup safari, because in Berlin is a center for, for these ed tech startups. Um, uh, and they will grow in importance that they have already conquered the uh, afternoon, so to speak, uh, the private tuition market, which is a big market in, in this country and other countries. But I think they will grow in importance are certainly drivers in modern forms of using data and, and so on. Thank you very much. Let me take us on to the final section of the Berlin Consensus, which is a really broad section, a really important section, but I just perhaps want to ask you to highlight one or two things. It's new pedagogic teaching concepts uh, and, um, and evidence, and I'd like to take one audience question here to get us started, which uh, perhaps is not directly under this roof, but, but kind of. Namely, how can agile research look also in terms of, of openness to the public, communication of results, and transfer to practice? So essentially also getting at that evidence issue and communicating, uh, including communicating science. Anybody? I mean, in a way, it also falls into your informal education yeah. bracket. Sorry, if we'll sure, sorry. <laughs> maybe, maybe I start. Uh, well, I would say, research is agile. <laughs> so, usually. Um, we are keen on, on, on communicating research results. Um, we are putting them online as discussion papers or um, as uh, releases for, 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 for press, for the, for the media, so everybody can look at the results. So I would say there is already, I mean, research is already a, a field that is quite agile and open because we need to discuss results to, to have controversial discussions and um, to have controversial insights also. But, but researchers are not always adept at communicating to the public in ways that the public really can, uh, can take in yeah. or not. Now, if I'm thinking of uh, CW as our institute, we do, we do it. It's one of our main goals to do that. Yeah, so, but I agree that not every researcher, maybe, or not, not every discipline, or depending on whether you work in an in a institution that is publicly funded or only in a, un, or in a university that is focusing on research, this might be different. Yeah. And also to, to find the right uh, wording for communicating results 
is not uh, an easy task. So. The public understanding of science debate dates back to the 90s, and I think we make, uh, made uh, uh, quite some progress uh, also due to uh, organization, uh, organizations like the AAAS. Uh, but the new thing, and Rush Holt mentioned that, is uh, citizen science, where, uh, because that's public understanding of science, and that scientists talk to people is one thing, but participation and really uh, part participating in uh, ongoing research. That's a new thing, and that is enabled by digital technologies. So you, you can be a part of a big science uh, project at CERN, for example, as a, as a student in school. So that's really new and uh, promising. I think it's an interesting area where actually journalists and scientists could be yeah. working together. And I think AAAS yeah. even has a, an initiative working with science writers. Because not all journalists can, can communicate the science either. So we're right. sort of, we're, we're missing an interpreter somewhere in there, a translator to help um, improve this sort of openness. Because the information could be open. There was a study a number of years ago where a database of information related to um, HIV and AIDS was opened up worldwide. And everybody said, oh, this is going to change everything. Well, it only really changed things for the same researchers who had already been using it. It wasn't put in a format that would be accessible. So thinking about those partnerships outside of science to help with the communications could be great. I would just add that the work like Sanjay Gupta does uh, goes, talks, extracts that from the researchers and then actually presents it in a format that the public can understand the research. Well, we saw it yesterday. There was a video of the gentleman teaching mathematics on, and then the science, and asked the scientist or whatever that other one was. So I think there's individuals are starting to try to translate. I think these concepts as well. So this is an informal learning and informal tutoring opportunity. May I ask if there's anybody out there who is burning to ask a question with one of these? Uh, we are unfortunately out of time, but if there's one really pithy question out there, I'll try to work it in. And otherwise, I have one final question for all of you with an absolutely enormous universal scope, but I'm going to ask you to answer it as briefly as you can. And it's, it's an area that comes up in the Berlin Consensus a couple of times, and it's the idea that all of this kind of education that we're talking about, when we talk about paving the way for a digital future, that we're also in some sense talking about education as a basis, as a springboard for something we might think of as global citizenship. Um, so a big aspiration. What would be really crucial to, to create that kind of a basis going forward? if you can just reduce it to a few basic ideas or principles. And I'll just go right down the panel. And maybe we've said all the things that are part of this, but yeah. Maybe we need, need something like a global curriculum for the grand challenges, <laughs> like uh, the sustainable development goals. That would be wonderful to have that uh, handled and dealt with in schools all over the world. And the grand challenges are there. They can be defined, and uh, it's problem-oriented, and it's challenging, and it's motivating for young, young people. I would agree with him, but then we start from science. Um, if you go to history, the whole thing will die, because everybody has their own way of thinking. But look at some of the math, uh, which is online, which everybody talks about globally. So if we begin with science slowly, we can eventually be, build a, a global, global citizenship. Yeah, I also think that we should uh, start in a small environment, like uh, in a specific type of, um, uh, of subject, like math also. <laughs> and, uh, or, and if you look at Germany, we could also start by um, putting more weight to, uh, to the federal state level uh, in organizing education and not leaving that to 16 sub-states. 
I may be biased, but I think informal education, uh, I think has a really important yeah. role. Because what we heard from each of the panelists, um, Barbara and Tomas and Florian and um, Pierre, and, and Rush kicked us off by saying, you know, informal learning is learning by choice. And to help people to become, you have to first decide, I want to be a global citizen. How do we partner across countries, which we heard a lot about on that panel? How many countries had said, oh, we're going to partner students from, from Africa with students from Germany? Those are two, that's not two countries. I know that, sorry about that. Um, but if I'm working with Nigeria and, and Germany or partnering, um, partnering students even within the refugee camps was very interesting. So there's something about informal learning that allows us to take responsibility for each other and to help each other sort of come along. Uh, if we're all going to be committed to being global citizens, we all have to be committed to helping each other to become global citizens. And perhaps an informal environment is the best way to do that. Thank you very, very much to all of you. Please let's give them a very warm round of applause. <laughs>